you. We've been talking about caregiving throughout the day, sort of it's been threaded in, but I feel like this is a moment to dig in in a deeper way because both of you come at this with such real lived experience and such systemic knowledge about how do we bring all these different systems together to make change. Um, Srita, I want to start with you, if that's all right. Um, set the stage for us a bit on why caregiving matters so much right now at this exact moment. Yeah. Well, caregiving matters so much in this moment because, frankly, our care needs are exploding as a nation. And we've talked a little bit about this throughout the day with the demographic shifts. We're in right. an unprecedented elder boom. Uh, people are living longer lives. Um, in fact, they're living 20 years longer than when our safety net was first put in place. Um, there's chronic illnesses that are increasing, and so elder care, there's just more need for elder care right now. But at the same time, we are in the first wave of millennials who are beginning to have children. So when you look at the full spectrum of care, we actually have care needs in terms of elder care, but we also <coughs> have growing child care needs in our country. Um, and so in the midst of that, those demographic shifts, we also understand, I think as Yoko said earlier, about 80 to 90% of aging Americans prefer to age at home. Right. So the demand for home-based care is really growing. And so the question we sit with in terms of caregiving is who are the people on the front lines who are providing dignified care in the home? And what do both unpaid family caregivers and a paid workforce need in order to support our loved ones to live, age, and die, or end well. Right, beautifully put. And, and one of the other demogra demographic shifts, as you sort of reference, is there's this huge number of young, youngish, mid middle-aged people who are unemployed, and here's this job that huge numbers of people could could fall into if we can create it in a structured, dignified way, right? That's exactly right. Care jobs are actually the jobs of the future right. in this country um, because of this, this demand. Um, yet, care jobs are actually very undervalued in our society. Um, most care workers are, in fact, uh, predominantly women. They're a majority, of women, they're majority women of color and immigrants. These are very strenuous jobs. Right. On average, uh, the workforce makes poverty wages. I mean, right. $9 an hour, $13,000 a year. 30% of them depend on public assistance for food security. Um, and the thing we don't really recognize about home-based care workers is that they, too, are daughters, they too are mothers, right. who actually cannot sustain and support their own families and themselves. And so we have an opportunity right now, like this, these are the jobs of the future, to shape these jobs to be better family sustaining jobs of the future. Right, and, and our mutual friend, Ai Jen Poo, <laughs> has a book called The Age of Dignity, which if you have not checked out, I think really sets this down in such a clear way. Um, I feel so indebted to iGen's <laughs> wisdom on this stuff. Now, one of the things that I really wanted you to talk a little bit about is the movement itself. So carrying across generations, you do jobs for justice, but also carrying across generations with a coalition of, is it 200 now, organizations. That's right. How is it taking shape and who is it, what are you all fighting for? How would you sum that up for this audience? Well, Caring Across Generations is a movement of families, caregivers, people with disabilities, and aging Americans working to transform the way we care in this country so that all families have affordable and accessible care options to ensure that their loved ones can age with dignity. And so what that means is that we're really pushing for this idea that we need a care infrastructure. You know, like we talk about infrastructure, we need roads and highways when we think about the physical world and the infrastructure bridges, right? Or we think about the internet and the digital world. Well, we argue and posit that we actually need care infrastructure in this country because care is actually what makes all other work possible. Right. And it's so essential to our economy. So part of what we're pushing for is a care infrastructure that helps create more options, affordable and accessible options for all families, that helps provide real supports to family caregivers and helps to strengthen and grow the paid workforce. 
And that's what we're essentially fighting for. Um, and I just have to say for a moment, this is so uh, essential, and I feel it. Like, we've been talking a lot about how this work is personal. Yeah. I myself am a working family caregiver in the sandwich generation. Let me just unpack that for yeah. a quick second. Um, so I have, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago. He's a retired physician. Um, and my mother has pretty chronic arthritis. The both of them decided about three years ago to move into my home. And at the same time... Let's hope you also invited them. You I made it sound did. like they, they just no. showed up with their bags. No, and this is like what I've appreciated about the conversations about, like we need to have the conversation about the end of life. Yeah. We had to have a conversation about care and what yeah. our parents want right. and need and what we want and need. And frankly, it's a relief to have them in my home right. versus hundreds of miles away. But at the same time, I have a seven-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I are often feel like we're sandwiched, hence the sandwich generation. And sometimes we actually go as far to say the panini generation, because <laughs> we really feel squeezed in the middle of trying to like, meet the care needs on both ends of the spectrum. Right. And I do this work, and I find it so hard to navigate the supports that my father needs, my mother needs, my daughter needs, I need, you yes. know, my husband needs. So I can't imagine what it's like for working people in this country to navigate a system they don't understand, or if they work in places with unpredictable schedules, or they don't have salaries like you know that can afford some of the care that they need, or they just don't have the um, the capacities and supports in place. Right. Um, so that's what's really driven me to begin and start this movement and to really intertwine and understand the interdependence of uh, a paid workforce and family caregivers. Right, that's awesome. Thank you for bringing it to that personal level. And interestingly, my last book, I reported a lot on, on housing and multi-generational <laughs> housing. And the research on multi-generational housing is that people are actually much happier and report higher quality of life in multi-generational homes. The headlines are that it's boomerang kids and it's like lazy kids in the basement. And, you know, there's all these sort of negative connotations to multi-generational housing. But the truth is that for many people, it functions incredibly well and is sort of this like rekindling of a way we used to live. So I'm so glad that you brought it up. Um, Cynthia, this is like the perfect time for you to come in because you support people like Sarita, people who are <laughs> dealing with so much caregiving responsibility through the Alameda County Care Alliance. Can you tell us about how it works and why you founded it? Absolutely. The Alameda County Care Alliance is an organization that is faith-based and community-based. And basically, we partner with health systems. We partner with academic institutions. We partner with the public health institution as well. And the whole idea is, is that with a collaborative approach, we can really get to the heart and meet the needs of those that are dealing with serious illnesses, advanced illnesses, as well as their caregivers. So this whole notion of bringing people together, we've heard over and over about the connectivity issues around this important issue of caring for folks that are dealing with advanced illness. This movement, I believe very seriously, is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. Caregivers are struggling. Uh, Sarita mentioned her own personal situation as caregiver. I too have been caregiver for my father. Um, we work and train care navigators mm -hmm. within the churches. So the idea, when you think about a community health worker, imagine a trained individual within a faith organization, if you will, that literally is trained to talk about advanced care planning, to talk about Pulse here in California, our one-page uh, advanced directive document, but so many other issues around helping people to find resources. Mm -hmm. We all know that the healthcare system does a wonderful job in what it does, but think about more boots on the ground, <laughs> more hands that are involved to really help this critical issue of helping caregivers really care for themselves. Isn't That's that a novel idea? Let's try a quick, how many people in this room have been a caregiver for someone who is dying? Huge number. How many yes. felt adequately supported in your role as caregiver? Maybe three hands. Okay, three hands. so yes. your work is <laughs> very needed. We're not surprised, right? Yes. Um, what are the biggest needs that you hear caregivers saying? That they, What are they really needing from you all? Well, I can say right off the top, very clearly, respite support. 
Caregivers simply need a break. Mm. They need somebody, can I say, that gives a care mm. to them, that recognizes that they'd like to get out and go to the movies, or they'd like to get out and get their hair done, or just have a breath and have a moment to really have time alone. Mm. And so that is absolutely the largest need, to help people to supply and support them through respite support. That's number one. But in addition to that, I'd like to focus a bit on the person that needs care. And of course, that's the individual that that caregiver is supporting. One of the things that our trained care navigators do within the faith context is literally go to the doctor's office with that wonderful person that is mm. in need of care. Well, there you go. It's helping that caregiver, giving them a break, and that's an opportunity for them to do those wonderful things that will help replenish their spirit, their mind, their body. And if I could just use this moment to say, Courtney, that it's really important, uh, and we've heard it over and over in the, in the various speakers today, the holistic approach to this work, the mind, the body, the spirit, the psychosocial, this movement addresses all of those within the context of the collaborative relationships that we have. If individuals are spiritual and want prayer and want meditative practices that are unique to whatever their spiritual practice might be, we honor that. We're now getting referrals from the health system. So we have relationships. Kaiser Permanente Community Benefits is our lead funder. We get referrals from um, Kaiser, but we also get referrals from Alameda Health Systems, Highland Hospital, the community clinics. And so this notion is beginning to really spread that there is a great resource right within our faith communities and will honor where people are coming from, whatever that spiritual context may be or may not be. So help us understand the model a little bit more because it's fairly new and it's yes. so innovative. I have a feeling it's going to be replicated and scaled other places. So are the navigators themselves paid? They are indeed. Okay. And we're very proud of the fact. That's another thing. Uh, Sarita mentioned it very beautifully. And the fact that caregivers are typically not paid uh, well in terms of their salaries and so forth. Well, care navigators are a type of caregiver themselves, are they not? Right. That's and so we do have our care navigators trained and paid. We have some full-time, most are part-time, but it really honors the fact that we value the work that they do and the resource and the connectivity. And how about this notion, loneliness. Mm -hmm. right. In underserved communities and in Alameda County, and now we're serving persons that need care and caregivers in Contra Costa uh, County also, one of the key things that we see, particularly in underserved communities, is number one, issues around isolation. Mm -hmm. I mean, people that are either caregivers or dealing with advanced illnesses simply feel alone. And so training people within the faith context, not only the care navigators, but how about the pastors? Mm -hmm. How about the spiritual leaders? Mm -hmm. So we're training pastors and spiritual leaders as well to understand more about advanced care planning, advanced directives, the pulse, uh, it, the list goes on and on, but there is a reservoir of, I tell you, foot soldiers that are out there really waiting and willing. You'd be quite surprised. And we are speaking their language. What do I mean by that? We find that, uh, and of course statistics have constantly show that people would prefer to have their care in the home setting, particularly at end of life. But what we're finding is that we get people to open up mm -hmm. about issues, choosing a healthcare agent. Who might that be? Have you considered that? And oftentimes they tell us that we would like to have those conversations in a doctor's office or in hospital settings, but we feel rushed or we don't feel heard or we're speaking two different languages. The beauty of this model is that we are in their home having them ask questions mm -hmm. that are pertinent to them and listening very carefully. Listening is so very key, so very key in this critical arena that we're talking about today. I appreciate that, like Randy, who spoke earlier about the work on the South Side, this is about going to where people are instead of expecting people to be Absolutely. able to show up and ask the questions they need to ask, right? Really, like in this case, if they're in church, you show up in church and you have a trusted individual, which is this navigator, yes. helping them figure out the system. Um, is that how, because I would imagine one of the challenges for the population you're serving is, you know, 
they have frankly been screwed over by the healthcare system in many ways. Mm. You know, people of color, women, low income folks, like folks experiencing poverty. So they have every reason to distrust mm -hmm. what they're hearing from various authorities. Is, yes. is the navigator sort of positioned as a trusted person who can help them retrust the healthcare system? I mean, how do you think about trust with this group? Huge and extremely important topic. Trust is key, critical, crucial when it comes to this whole notion about helping me navigate systems, healthcare systems, where you're absolutely right. You know, we, we know of all kinds of studies and issues that have happened in various communities as it relates to uh, disparities on many levels. But we find that, thank goodness, there is still a great deal of trust within the faith community context. Right. People still respect the leader, the rabbi, the imam, mm -hmm. the pastor, the priest in many instances. And so that's an important, once again, group that really appreciates and engages in this very important discussion. So trust is huge. And again, don't forget, we're in the comfort of their home. So we have five visits uh, via uh, uh, actual visits within the home setting, uh, visits via the phone, but we also, um, that is pretty much the context of how our program works and operates within a six month time period. But we find because there's so much loneliness and isolation, many times we have to extend that based upon the needs of the individual. And oftentimes we find that within the faith context, we have the opportunity then to have what we call a soft handoff. Mm -hmm. So that's the other entities and organizations within that church or synagogue that can also help when that navigator needs to move on and help care for others. So it's, it's a very interesting thing that happens. Not only are you training navigators and pastors, but we have a quadre of volunteers. Hmm. And, you, and as you can imagine, you need to train a lot of people to begin to really pass the baton and be present for those individuals that really need that support. Hmm. So the trust piece is huge. Yeah. And, and we're very proud of the fact that we're getting incredible response. Awesome, thank you. Um, Sarita, turning to one of the challenges that you're up against, or a challenge and opportunity, I'd say, is you know, you're an organizer. Mm -hmm. You know how to organize against a big bad boss yeah. who is you know, abusing its workers. But in this case, caregiving is a much more complex and dynamic system, right? As someone who employs a caregiver for my children, mm -hmm. you know, I consider Betsy my ally, and, and I hope she considers me hers. So, some of the great work you guys are doing is around how do we organize not against a particular bad guy, in right. quotes, but think about how do we all have something to gain from shifting how this culture thinks about and also pays and dignifies caregiving work. That's what right. are the challenges of organizing when there is no big bad boss, <laughs> so, so to speak? Not that there aren't exploitative or abusive employers, but That's there's right. not like one person to target. That's right. No, it's a great question. I appreciate it so much. And what you said is right. I mean, our approach is that we need to organize, but we need culture change. And I've so, I feel so at home in this space where we're talking about the need to talk about how we end well. We also need to talk about how we age well mm -hmm. um, and what that looks like and means. So in the context of not having a big bad boss, I, I would actually posit that our bad guy is a mentality of scarcity mm. that exists in our system. You know, there's, and when you operate in a mode of scarcity, then what happens is you pit the interests of communities and groups of people against one another. So for too long in the context of long-term care, the interests of consumers or patients of care and the interests of the workforce that we were talking about are pitted against each other. And part of what we said is, how do we disrupt this? Right. Actually, we all need to be, like, let's, let's re-slice this pie, right? right? We actually need a whole new system that values caregiving and caregiving relationships. Um, and so, but, so we reject scarcity, and instead what we do is we embrace abundance. Right. And if you operate in a mode of abundance, then you can actually bring people together to be generative and innovative and come up with the solutions that they need. Um, and so that's been our approach, is tapping into people's hearts 
and minds, mm -hmm. tapping into people's hopes and aspirations and organizing from that place of love, right? right? And well-being. Um, and so what that concretely looks like or translates on the ground is uh, just an example. In the state of Maine, we brought together multi-stakeholders, you know, because we believe the challenge we're trying to address here we're going to need, you know, solutions coming, bringing together government, the private sector, healthcare, uh, the nonprofit sector, the social movements. You know, all need to be a part of creating the new system we need. And in order to do that, we are on the ground setting up multi-stakeholder tables. So in the state of Maine, we are actually advancing an effort for home care for all. Home mm. care for people with disabilities and for aging adults in the state of Maine. And a key component of that effort is creating a trust that is actually going to be, you know, there'll be a board of representatives of home care workers, representatives mm. of family caregivers, um, representative employers, um, and certainly the state, to think together in designing what the system looks like and setting the wages and the labor standards and the caregiving standards. Um, what is quality of care um, moving forward? Fascinating. And so is that, I mean, give us a little sense of the strategic approach here. Is it, if we prove this in Maine, or a f I'm sure a few other states are doing better than others, um, that that becomes the model that we can replicate in other states? Is there federal policies we should have our eye on, or both at the same time? Yep, we're trying to do both. I mean, it's a little rough at the federal level right now, as you all well, Whatever imagine. are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> absolutely, in states, like, look, states are on the front lines of this issue, right? right? And so Maine, Hawaii, we just won a terrific Kapuna Caregiver Assistance Program. To yes. your point, um, when it, we basically were able to win a financial benefit for working family caregivers to be oh. able to support their loved ones and not have to make that impossible choice of leaving the workforce That's in order huge. to do that. That's huge. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Huge win. Thank you. Worth clapping yes. for. Um, but states are modeling for us right now what's possible. Yeah. And at the Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Why did that work in Hawaii? <laughs> what was it yeah. about that? Se I mean, of course, Hawaii. Hawaii. But, uh, no. <laughs> but no, what, yeah. what was... What can we learn from that? Why did that well, pass there? It was a lot of it was about um, bringing people together in communities across the state. We actually started to listen to what people needed, to your point, like we need mm -hmm. to listen and understand. And one of the things we recognized is we couldn't just solve the issues of having a larger and better compensated paid workforce if we didn't also address the fact that so many working people are unpaid family caregivers. Right. and are struggling. Um, so it was bringing, the, again, the multi-stakeholders together, really talking about the value of care and what it means to actually value our elders. Right. And really, we're able to generate energy, both from culture change strategies as well as policy, to figure out how we move this forward in the state. So there's, there's a lot we're learning about the importance of bringing people together, the importance of talking about care. This is so private. It's such a privately held thing. Yeah. And people feel personally, like we talked about burdened earlier, or yeah. people feel like a failure, that they can't meet the care needs of their families, and so they don't talk about it. So part of what we've been doing is creating spaces where people can bring their care stories forward right. and recognize that others are struggling with similar things, and together we can come up with public solutions. That's so great. And it, it reminds me of one of the things you said on the phone, Cynthia, which is people don't even realize they are caregivers. Exactly. It's like so invisible. Exactly. And you know, I'm, I was like tromping around the neighborhood. I had to go pick up my one-year-old and get my four-year-old here, and I was like, oh, Oh, I guess I'm a caregiver, which, you know, it's like, it just yes. doesn't occur to us mm -hmm. on some level because it's, it's been made invisible by a culture that values productivity and deliverables mm -hmm. and all these things that don't fit into the milieu of what it means to care on a very regular, sacred basis for someone, right? So why is it important for people to understand their caregivers? And also, can you talk a little bit, Cynthia, about how you all are, are sort of elevating caregiving mm -hmm. through awards and other ways of saying, like, we see this and it is valuable. Sure. You know, I think we could probably all agree that caregiving is one of the most unselfish acts mm -hmm. uh, that we could possibly think of. People typically respond to the love and the concern and the compassion that their parents gave to them 
or their grandparents or aunts or um, adopted relatives, but there is a response, a human response. Uh, I love the fact that this whole notion of dealing with advanced illness and dealing with the support of caregivers and the support that they need is such a human, human component. Uh, and that brings me great joy, and I'll tell you why, because we're all in this together. No matter what your ethnic background may be, no matter how you were raised, no matter your social economic background, no matter what, we are all human beings, mm -hmm. human beings. We have that in common. And so when it comes to this whole idea around caregivers and showing them that love and showing them that compassion that they many times take for granted uh, that nobody really cares, right. that nobody sees them, that no one hears them. One of the things that we do, well, we do several things, but one that we're really proud of is we have what we call an annual caregiver recognition celebration. And in this recognition celebration, um, we have all of our care navigators, our pastors, our care volunteers, we often refer to them as care ministers, and literally, uh, we invite folks throughout the community. Uh, they don't have to be a part of the program, if you will, but the idea is that they are a caregiver, an unsung hero or shero, if you will. And so when we meet them at their cars and we help them, many of them mm -hmm. are, unfortunately, and we all also know this, that many times caregivers are giving so much that we see them decline and unfortunately often die. Uh, wow. even before the person that they are caring for passes away. Wow. So our job is to how do we lift them up? How mm -hmm. do we celebrate them? How do we cause them to know just how important that they are and that they're, they are just, you know, the stars in our eyes? And so we have done some unique things. Most recently, I, I love um, the speaker before us that talked about the power of music mm -hmm. and the right kind of sounds. And so one of the things that we've done is in our faith context, we have assembled, we have about 14 churches now uh, that are partnered with us where we have these care navigators. So we also dig deeper into the vast resources that the faith community holds. And so the singers, the choirs, the praise leaders, the worshipers, they all participate in this huge, we call it one voice mass choir. Hmm. And so we have rehearsals and all of this to prepare for this grand celebration. And this year, I'm so proud to say that that we've been able to uh, produce a CD, and it's called Courage for Caregivers. You are not alone. Oh, that's great. You are not alone. And we give it away for free mm -hmm. to all the caregivers and then individuals that are interested in purchasing it. It simply continues to fund the replication of the CDs, and we continue to give them away. And so those are two ways that we support caregivers and lift them up. But we also have really um, fairly intense if I might say, caregiver support groups. Yeah. Mm. And so we partner with uh, the Centers for Elder Independence and the Family Caregiver Alliance and so many other organizations within the community that are already doing this great work. Um, and so we partner with them and we have speakers and series. And I'll have to tell you, uh, I've been in the hospice field for uh, since the early 90s when my dad needed hospice care. And one of the things that we've learned is caregivers just need to be heard. Mm. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times when we have these small, intimate caregiver support groups, eight to 10 people that are caregivers, and we have a speaker there that has you know, some important topics that we have heard from them that they're interested in, such as self-care. But inevitably, those caregivers need to say, I'm tired, I'm angry, uh, tell me more about your situation. They want to hear from one another. It's a wonderful exchange that supports them knowing that someone else is managing those same challenges that they are. So they just oftentimes just want to be in a circle with other caregivers and simply have the sense that they're being heard. Right, right. I love that at, on this stage today, we've had the like so much conversation about technology and science, and sometimes like it is about how do we redesign things, and then sometimes it's like the simplest technology in the universe, which is put a group of humans together in a room, put them in a circle, and say like, what do you all need from That's one right. another, and how can you help each other out, right? Absolutely, um, Sarita. How can we in this room be supportive of this work? On the one hand, of course, we can all sort of 
make sure our own houses are in order? Do we pay the caregivers <laughs> right. that we employ well? Do we provide health insurance? Like mm -hmm. these very basic forms of dignity. But beyond that, how can we be supportive of caring across generations? Yeah, it's a, so I would say um, one is to acknowledge that there is a paid workforce and an unpaid family caregiver um, networks that are essential um, to the kinds of care, we call it care squads that individuals and families need. Mm. I love listening to you, Cynthia, because as you were describing the care navigators and the pastors and all the people on the front line, as well as the family members, and if you add a paid workforce in there, mm. like that's a care squad that mm -hmm. surrounds a family or an individual um, in important moments, right? Um, and so the question is how can we in this room acknowledge and really value the important work that, that people do in that yes. regard, and how do we actually think creatively about the integration of a home care workforce in the work of many in this room? Right. So what's the relationship between home-based care and when and if a person needs to move into a medical setting? What's the communication? Often we hear from home care workers who say, no one ever asked me what the person I care for on a daily basis wants but I know what they want. Of course. And yeah. so how can, we think, how can we think creatively and redesign um, is one. The second is... As can I pause you yeah. real quick? Because I want to say one thing as the white lady on the stage with a bunch of white people in this audience. I think this is in part about race because the story that white Americans exactly. tell about our families is that we have our white picket fence and we have our home and we have our 2.5 kids and we take care of everything until they go to a professional setting like a hospital. And the people who are caregiving for everyone are often somehow invisibilized. I mean, they're in the home and, and we may have a relationship with them, but we don't talk about them publicly. Right. And you know, I had this experience where I posted something about our child care provider, Betsy, on Facebook and someone was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen someone post about their, like a picture of their child care provider. And I was like, that's weird. Yeah. Like yeah. what is wrong with white people that, <laughs> but no, really, I mean, I'm really challenging white folks in the audience. This is largely, there is a big racial component of this conversation and we need to recognize that That's the story right. we tell about white America is part of this. That's right. Um, so oh. we, gotta tell, we gotta tell a more honest story and yeah. we gotta acknowledge the wisdom of the people who are in in the home, taking care of this person exactly. every single day, to your point. Okay, I just no, had to interrupt I'm with so my white person thing. Now that. go ahead. Because my next thing I was gonna say is to help be an advocate, to help strengthen and grow this workforce. I mean, there, it is by design, for precisely the reasons you said, racial inequities, gender inequities, immigrants who have, like, are really the the workforce that we're talking about, and they are so undervalued. They are made invisible. Um, so again, if we understand that home care jobs are the jobs of the future, it's projected a 30% growth in these jobs in the next mm. 10 to 12 years. We together, right now, can seriously shape these jobs to have better compensation, to professionalize this workforce, to give training and career ladders. Like all of those things can in fact happen if we work together. Right. So to advocate and help us do that. And finally, we have lots of big ideas. You know, mm -hmm. I talked about home care for all and like, you know, this idea of long term care. We've also been playing out with concepts of family care efforts. So how can we create systems of care that support families through the continuum of care from you know, child care to paid leave uh, to um, elder care and paid leave for a moment just to say as supports for family, working family caregivers. It is crazy that we are like one of the only countries in the world that does not have paid medical family leave, right? And there's so many people we talk to when we talk about elder care and they say to us, this is great, but we actually need childcare and actually I need more supports at work to be able to do this. Right. Um, so we, we're thinking about a whole set of family care policies that can be woven together. Um, and we would invite all of you to help us with some of these big ideas and help us think specifically about how we support and grow a workforce as well as the supports for working and unpaid family caregivers. So awesome. Um, Cynthia, will you close us out talking a little bit about organ donation? Because I was so... <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so struck by the story you told when we talked about, you know, you know, I just did my white person spiel, <laughs> and part of this is about th the differences, the very real, deep, and long differences in this country about how we treat people based on race and class and gender and all the rest of it. But you talked about this beautiful moment that you've worked in professionally where organ donation is happening among people who have nothing demographically in common and, and how that can be a moment of opening and healing. Will you tell us a little bit about that to close us out? I'd be happy to. I, I had the wonderful privilege of serving as a business development manager for the California Transplant Donor Network here in, in uh, Northern California. And I was sharing with uh, uh, Courtney and the team that, you know, it's really interesting, but when it comes down to life and humanity and the things that really are common to all of us, many times we take it for granted. And I was sharing an experience. Uh, I can remember uh, an elderly Caucasian gentleman that lives in Knob Hill in San Francisco. And uh, he needed a very much, uh, uh, desperately needed a heart transplant. And so there was an African-American family, actually it was a Latino family, uh, that lived in what we often refer to as Deep East Oakland. Um, and very poor family, not a lot of resources, but they had great heart. And so their beloved young son was killed tragically in an automobile accident. And this generous family decided that they wanted to share their son's organs, and there was a much needed heart that matched uh, for this older gentleman, actually, not too old, but he was older than the young uh, man that was killed. And the, the unique thing about this relationship is the, the wealthy gentleman in San Francisco was lived in his family said very isolated life. As a matter of fact, he had some issues as it related to people of color. They were very honest about the fact that he was very uncomfortable around people of color because that was not his experience. He had lived a very wealthy and well-kept life. And so isn't it interesting that that Latino young man was able to extend the life, the ultimate gift of giving his heart to the Caucasian gentleman in San Francisco. And so when we think about this whole notion of where we live and our various economic backgrounds and status and skin color and all of these things, the great equalizer is that we all want to live and that we can help support one another and some of the most difficult and challenging times of life, but it is an opportunity for us to embrace community right. on every level, and that certainly was an eye-opening experience for me to see firsthand. Thank you, Cynthia. You two are my personal heroes of abundance, and I'm sure many people in this audience share my gratitude for everything you've taught us today, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.